we'll continue reading from God's holy word from the book of Acts chapter 2. And these are words will be our text for uh, this morning. We'll continue at verse 14 and read through to the end of verse 21. Beginning at verse 14, then David and then Peter uh, stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Uh, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So far, reading from God's holy word. Brothers, sisters of our Lord in Jesus Christ. It's ten days after the Lord Jesus ascended up into heaven uh, that he fulfills the promise in which he sends the Holy Spirit into the lives of the believers who had gathered uh, in the city of Jerusalem. It was a joyful occasion for the disciples and the believers were assured that the Lord Jesus had now kept his promise that he's not going to leave them alone. For now he had indeed sent the Holy Spirit who would now be with them. And so we now think about also the Christian faith today. What we need to understand is the Christian faith is a living faith, a living faith. What that means is this. It means that Christians do not just believe in a set of truths. And we don't just live according to a set of rules because God told us that we should live this way. But as Christians, we believe that the Lord God is the one who also comes to live in us. And how does he now live in us? He lives in us through the power of his Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit who now changes us, who renews our hearts and who renews our lives every day because God is with us. It's interesting that Christians in the, have not always fully under, understood also the power of that living faith, understood either the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this week I was doing some reading about, uh, about the life of Reverend Jan Bavink, who was a minister in the Reformed churches in the Netherlands way back, more than 150 years ago, back in the 1850s. He wrote about the church in which he grew up and remembered his childhood experience the church in those days had become what we call liberal. By liberal we mean uh, that they had lost a sense of what the gospel really is. That the gospel is the new good news of life and salvation in, in Jesus Christ. That whoever believes in him will receive eternal life. And so he reflected on his childhood. He recalled that in the congregation and the church that he grew up in, he doesn't ever remember that in the preaching people were called to repentance he says, I never understood, never was taught the concept of regeneration and renewal. Those are all things that he had to learn later on when he became a minister of the Word. Now, you may ask, how is that possible that you can grow up in a church where you don't hear about regeneration, you don't hear about the need to, uh, to believe in the Lord Jesus for your salvation? And the simple answer is that happens when God's people do not truly believe the events that took place on the day of Pentecost. Because what happened on Pentecost is that the Lord God himself, he came into this world that he might live in the hearts and that he might live also in the lives of his people. You see, when God comes into our life, God comes as a power power that changes, changes us. 
You see, true Christian believers do not just believe that God is up there in the sky or up in the heavens somewhere. <clears throat> there are a lot of people who would say, yeah, I believe that there is a God or some greater power out in the universe. But as believers, we also understand that the Lord God is a God who is with us as he has promised he would be with us. And it is by the very power of the Holy Spirit that I don't only believe the gospel message. Yes, it's the Spirit that causes me to believe the message, but the Spirit is also changing who I am, changing my life. Right? The Spirit that opens my eyes that I may see my own sinful nature as the, as the law is being read. I, I, re, I reflect on that law and I see, you know what? I don't obey the will of God as God expects that from me. And it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that I then also repent and I am now sorry for my sins. And I begin to recognize how my attitude is a rebellious attitude against the Lord my God. Through the power of the Spirit, I'm now able to cry out, Lord, forgive me my sins. And Lord, give me the power that I can also change my life, that I may live each day to the glory of your holy name. Now when Jesus told his disciples that he would give to them the Holy Spirit, we need to keep in mind that Jesus didn't just come with a brand new promise. As with so much of Jesus' teaching, Jesus didn't come and teach something completely new and, and different. No, his promise is based on, one that, on a promise that God had already given long before uh, through the prophet Joel, where Joel said that afterwards God says he will send his spirit on all his people. Right? And so when the, the people in Jerusalem asked the disciples on the day of Pentecost, uh, uh, what is this that we see happening and we hear happening here? And then what does Peter do? Peter doesn't say, well, this is what Jesus said. No, Peter says, this is what Joel, the prophet Joel said would happen in the last days. For God already long ago said that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all people. And so Pentecost reveals that we are now living in what the Bible calls the last days. And the fact that we're still in the last days means simply this. It means that there is still time for mankind, still time for people to repent and to seek their salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. But because they're the last days, it also means that the days are becoming short. And so there's an urgency for people to repent, an urgency for people to look to the Lord Jesus for their life and for their salvation. And so this morning I may proclaim to you God's word that under this theme, since Pentecost, we now live in the last days. So since the, t the time of Pentecost, we now live in the last days is our theme. We look three things under that theme. Uh, first of all, we looked at, at this as being a time uh, of renewal. And secondly, that we're living in a time of crisis. And thirdly, uh, that we, there's also a place of security for us in these last times. And so early on Pentecost Sunday, we we're told that the believers were meeting together in, in Jerusalem when suddenly they heard a sound like the blowing of a violent wind that came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were. And they also saw what seemed to be like tongues of fire that rested on each one of them. They were all filled. Peter, uh, Luke says in Acts, they're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues. Other tongues is a reference here and to uh, other languages. But they were not the only ones who heard this and saw this. There were also the people in the city. They, they heard the sound as well. And so the crowds uh, came uh, to see what was happening. And when the people saw this, they were amazed. But there's some we're told, who mocked them, saying, these people, they, they have had too much wine. They must be drunk. And then Peter, Peter stands up and begins to explain to the people, no, we're not drunk, as some of you suppose. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning, but this, what you see happening, was already spoken about, would happen by the prophet Joel long ago. 
Now it's interesting here, but also important to note that Peter begins by addressing this crowd about their accusation. He addresses, the first thing he does, he addresses their accusation uh, that they said, you guys must be drunk. And why does he do that? Well, this accusation is actually ironic. In light of what God says to the people of Israel in Joel chapter 1, verse 5. Because already then, in the days of Joel, God said to the people of Israel, he said, Israel, my people, wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Wail, all you drinkers of wine. Wail because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. You know, the disciples of Jesus, then, they're being accused of the very thing that God accuses the people of Israel about, of already long ago long ago. God said to the people of Israel, he says, you're a drunk. And what he means is you are in a spiritual stupor. He says, you are like drunkards who cannot see reality. You are living in this alternate world because your mind isn't able to think straight because of your wine. You are pursuing your own desires. And therefore, the Lord also says to the people of Israel, because you are drunk, because you can't even see your own spiritual uh, situation, I'm going to bring my judgment upon you. The locusts, I will send the locusts. And the locusts will come like a plague and it will destroy the whole land uh, so that there will no longer be any new wine on which you can become drunk. And so what you see here at Pentecost is the disciples and the believers, they're being mocked as if somehow they're the ones who are drunk. But Peter, in, in essence, is really saying, is, no, we're not drunk. We are fully sober because we have received the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit renews our hearts and our minds so that we're able to see things in a proper way. In fact, it is the very mockers here in the, on the day of Pentecost who are drunk because they're unable to understand what God is doing here. Their hearts and their minds are, are closed like that of drunkards, while the hearts and the minds of the believers are now being opened by the very power of the Holy Spirit. And then Peter goes on, and he says, this is what the prophet Joel spoke. He says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Now, Joel there speaks about afterwards. Peter interprets the afterwards uh, to mean the last days. And so Peter says the pouring out of the Spirit on Pentecost is a signal that the last days have come. Now, we need to understand that when the Lord Jesus came from heaven and he came down to this world on Christmas Day, that things in the world began to change. When the Son of God himself comes down to this world, that is simply, that's a big deal. Do any one of you think that it's possible for the Son of God to come to this world and that nothing would change in this world? Remember when the Lord Jesus began his public, public ministry, then he said in Matthew 4, verse 17, he says to the people to whom he begins to preach, he says, repent. Why? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He says, people, repent, because the kingdom of heaven, it is coming very soon. Why? Because the king, I, as the king, I am here, and I'm establishing the kingdom of heaven here on this earth. And how will the Lord Jesus do that? Well, he will do that through the great victory that he will earn on the cross when he dies for the sins of his people, but also through his great resurrection when death is not able to hold him, but he gains victory over sin and over death. What Christ did when he came to this world was he destroyed the kingdom of darkness and of the evil one in order that he might call all mankind that they might come to him and they might come into the very kingdom of God. That means, beloved, that we're now living in a different time from the time before the Lord Jesus came. For when the Lord Jesus comes, Jesus brings a new age into this earth. And that new age, the Bible refers to it as the last days. 
And in the, it is the last days for this is a time that is going to lead to the great day of judgment. Peter says, you know, Joel already long ago, he spoke about these last days that we're now entering into. And when it comes, then Joel already told us uh, that God will pour his spirit out on all people. Well, remember that the situation in the days of Joel is that the people of Israel have become completely disobedient to, uh, to the Lord God. And so God had called Joel to go to the people, uh, his people, and to declare to the people that my judgment is coming upon you, Israel. I'm going to send the hordes of locusts, and they will swarm over the whole land, and it will devour everything in their path. Nothing's going to be left in your fields. There will not be any grain. There will be no grapes, no olives. There will be no other fruit. Uh, the, your herds, they will groan because there's nothing to eat. The granaries, they will be empty. And so what does Joel do? Joel calls the people of Israel, return to the Lord God, come to him in repentance. And then he says to his people, he says, when you turn to the Lord in repentance, the Lord will take pity on you, his people, and he will again restore your fortunes, you will restore everything back again in the land. And then afterward, Joel says, God promises, I will pour out my spirit on all the people. In these last days, God is going to bring about a lasting renewal. It's necessary for lasting renewal to have the outpouring of the Holy Spirit take place. Because the history of the people of Israel makes it very clear uh, that God's people in the Old Testament, they repeatedly became disobedient to the Lord God over and over again. And God now says, I will do something for which Moses already longed for way back in the wilderness as Israel was traveling to the promised land. Remember, you may remember that in Numbers 11, uh, there was a situation where the spirit that was rested on Moses was now also distributed to the, to the 70 elders. And it also came to rest, the Spirit also came to rest on a couple of young men who began to, to prophesy in the camp of Israel. And Joshua, who was Moses' helper at the time, uh, was concerned. And so he warned Moses, says, Moses, you've got to stop these men from prophesying because uh, they are threatening your authority. And then Moses says something incredible. He says in Numbers 11, verse 29, he says, I wish, I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets. And that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Now think of the situation with Moses. Moses has to deal with uh, people who are constantly grumbling and complaining when they were there in the wilderness. How stressful and how difficult it must have been for Moses to have to deal with that rebellious attitude in the hearts of the people. And so he says to him, Joshua, he says, Oh, I long that the Lord would give his spirit to all the people so that they may all prophesy. Why does he say that? Because Moses understands that through the power of the Spirit, the Lord can change and the Lord can renew the hearts of the people. And now, jumping forward to a couple of uh, number of centuries, in the days of Joel, the people again, what has happened? The people again become rebellious against the Lord God, become disobedient. But now what does God say? Now God says, well, in the last days that are coming, I will pour out my spirit on all people. God promises that there is going to be a new era when the Holy Spirit will renew the hearts of every one of his people. Now, of course, when Joel spoke here about all people, Joel is in his mind and would be thinking about the people of Israel. But now that Peter quotes these same words, Peter understands that God's promise although it's unquestionable as to how far he fully understood it yet at this particular moment. But he understands this promise needs to be understood as not only for Israel, but for the people of the whole earth. Now that the Lord Jesus has come, now the Lord Jesus has finished earning salvation for his people, now the message of salvation will go out uh, from the city of Jerusalem and will go out into the whole world. And wherever the message is proclaimed, there the Spirit will work in the hearts of the hearers. And so in these last days, Christ is busy working to expand the kingdom over the whole earth. 
And so Peter goes on and quotes from Joel, saying the Holy Spirit will cause your sons and your daughters to prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. First of all, Joel says that the spirit will be poured out. That means it will not just be a trickle, but it will be a great river, and the spirit will be poured out without any partiality. That means there will not be any privileged members of the church above other members. The Spirit will be given to sons and daughters. It will be given to the children as well as to their parents. It will be given to old men. It will be given to the young men. It will be given also to people from different social classes, not only to those who are rich, but even to my servants, literally to my slaves. Now we know that the Bible makes very clear that the Holy Spirit gives different gifts to different people. And he gives different people different roles within the church. And yet the point here is that the Holy Spirit will be given to every single member of the church. Now, of course, we also know from the course of church history that there will be those in the church who reject the Spirit. We know clearly that there are also hypocrites, because the Scriptures will speak about hypocrites among God's people. Last week, we, we heard from the, the Apostle Peter that there are deceivers and false teachers in the church who have rejected the Holy Spirit. And yet, we also see in the church that the Spirit is working powerfully when He works faith in the hearts of the elect. You know that without the Holy Spirit, a, no one is able to believe Without the, without the Holy Spirit, you cannot renew your own heart and you cannot renew your own life. Renewal only becomes possible through the powerful working of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And it is through the power of the Spirit that all God's people today will prophesy. Now we know that as believers, we also believe in the office of all believers so that we speak with the fact that we're all called as believers. We're all called to be prophets, to be priests, and to be kings. And so Joel says in these last days, we will, all believers will be prophets. But what does that mean? Well, let's make a comparison here, for example, to that of the fact. What does it mean to be called, that we're, to be called kings? That doesn't mean that we can all claim to be rulers in the world. There are only some people who are actual rulers. But to be kings means that we're called to fight against sin and against evil and to promote the kingdom of God in this world. And so we need to understand also that when Scriptures tell us that we are called to be prophets, we should not think that we are to receive a special, that we are as prophets, we will all receive special revelation from God uh, like the prophets did in the Old Testament. In fact, remember Paul says to the believers in Ephesus, chapter 1 and 11, he says that God gave some, God gave some uh, to be prophets. That means that God did give a special revelation to his church through some whom he had called to be prophets in the early Christian church. And so what Joel is talking about is that through the Holy Spirit, all believers receive this calling to be a witness to the world about the Lord Jesus and to speak to people about the very gospel message of salvation. And that becomes abundantly clear also on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came and what the Spirit did. Well, He opened the hearts of many men and women there in the city of Jerusalem. And when they heard the gospel message as Peter proclaimed it to them, uh, they believed the message and they looked up to the Lord Jesus for their salvation. And on that one day, over 3,000 souls were added to the church. And that, beloved, is a powerful testimony to the greatness and the might of the Spirit to change and renew the hearts of people. And then the gospel very quickly began to spread from Jerusalem into all the other nations of the earth. Keep in mind here, that on the day of Pentecost, 
And the people heard the disciples speaking to them, each in their own tongue, that is, each in their own language. Luke tells us that, that the Jews had come from all over the world, from all the different nations of the world, and, and made a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to serve God there in the temple. And as many of them were here uh, at this particular time in Jerusalem, they now heard the gospel message. And they heard about the work of the Lord in Jesus as the Savior. And they believed. And what they did is, that, of course, they returned home again. And when they returned home, they also witnessed to the people there what they had seen and what they had heard. And wherever they went, they proclaimed the word of God. And wherever they spoke about the saving work of the Lord Jesus, what the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit opened the hearts of many of the hearers. And so through the Spirit, God is bringing about renewal over the whole earth. God is renewing, you can say, in the world. God began to gather his people, not only from Israel, but from the Gentiles and from the different nations and the different peoples of the world. And so in these last days, God continues to gather his people from all over the world. And how did he do that? Well, beloved, he does that through the faithful witness of you and I and of his people everywhere. Beloved, we are called to prophesy. And prophesy does not mean here that we're all called to be ministers. It doesn't mean that we're all called here to be, be great preachers of the gospel. But it simply means this. It means that you're called to witness to the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And you can do that. You can also make that witness not through your own power, because often also God's people say, well, I don't know how to speak about the gospel. I don't know how to speak about my faith to others. And then we, tend, and we think we have to rely upon our own strength instead of turning to the Lord and turning to the power of the Spirit. We say, Lord, also give me the strength that I need. Give me the wisdom that I need through your Spirit that, that you may open not only my heart to better understand him, but that you may also open the hearts to whom I witness to a understanding and to be able to believe the gospel message. And so as we then witness, beloved, we also need to do that with, with that confidence, knowing that it is the Spirit who is able to open the hearts of those to whom we witness. And that renewal will then also come to this world and through the faithful, through our faithful prophesying about the name of our Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior. And then Joel, Joel also speaks about these last days as a time of crisis. Verses 19 through, through 20, he says this, he says, God will show wonders, he will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke, the sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Some strange language for many years. Language we talk about, we, can, we often call this apocalyptic language. It means as a language that describes the horrible things that are going to, to happen as we approach the end of the world. The horrible things that will happen on the earth also revealed that very quickly the judgment of God is coming. So you can really say that these things that, that are described by Joel, they're harbingers. Harbingers means they're signs of what will happen when the great day of judgment comes. After Joel finished warning the people of Israel uh, that God is going to send a great plague of locusts, then he continues to speak uh, to the people and say, no, and God's judgment is going to come upon all the nations of the, of the earth, all those nations who were in opposition to God and all those nations who tried to destroy God, nations such as Babylon and Assyria. And we know, of course, when we look at the history of Israel, that, that God uh, did destroy all those nations who oppressed Israel. They, too long, today, they no longer exist. But our question here is, so how does Peter see Joel's prophecy? How does he see that it is indeed fulfilled? What are these signs of? And there's some who suggest that Joel's prophecy may already be fulfilled uh, at the death of our Lord Jesus when he was on the cross because there on the cross, the wrath and the judgment of God came on the Lord Jesus for all of our sins. 
And then the Lord Jesus recognized, uh, understood that wrath of God was upon him during the three hours of darkness. The three hours of darkness. At the end of the Lord Jesus cries out, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right? It was a horrible time, and it was a sign of God's rejection of his own son because of our sins. There are also those who suggest that when the darkness came, then the, the, the moon would have become visible. Uh, and the moon may have looked like blood red. Um, and, and so it, that indeed may have happened. And so that may already be the initial fulfillment of this prophecy. But it's not the full fulfillment nor the complete fulfillment of what Peter's talking about here. Remember the Lord Jesus uses uh, uh, similar uh, imagery and similar language in Matthew chapter 24, verse 29, when he talks about the destruction of the city of Jerusalem and of the temple. The Lord Jesus Christ, he, he warned in Matthew 24, 29, uh, that in 70 A.D., and he didn't use the date, but, he's, but we know that in 70 A.D., the Romans came as Jesus said they would, and they destroyed the city of Jerusalem with the temple. And then Jesus himself also said in, in Luke 21, verse 11, he says, there will be great earthquakes, there will be famines, there will be pestilence in various places, and there will be fearful events, and there will be great signs from heaven. All of this, all those things Jesus says will reveal, or all of this that Jesus says there in, in, in Luke 21 is now revealed in greater detail for us by the Lord in the book of Revelation. And so we often say that we're now living in the last days. And God, in these last days, is already sending calamity upon the world. And when he sends calamity on the world, he sends that as a signal, uh, as a warning to all of mankind. Today, there are indeed, there have been wars and there's rumors of wars have always been with us throughout the New Testament period. Today, you only need to, to look at the devastation that has come in the Israeli and Palestinian conflict and you see how miserable conflict can be. Or you think of plagues, plagues that will cover the earth. And through the centuries, many plagues have come and have gone. And today, of course, we're dealing with the COVID virus that has spread over the whole world. And it causes people everywhere to live with constant fear for their lives. And there continue to be earthquakes that make people tremble. There are hurricanes and tornadoes. There are natural disasters that cause so much affliction and, and you can look at the unrest that you see in, in the streets of cities across the United States, a, a nation that is considered to be one of the greatest nations here on this earth. And, and yet, within many of the cities in that great nation, people feel insecure. Or you look at the division that is being sown today in our society between peoples of color and race, basically tearing the fabric of our, of our communities apart. And we see all those things happening, beloved. Should those, should those things, should they surprise us? Should it surprise us when, when our society becomes more and more hostile to God? And when God's message of grace and salvation is being rejected as our community and our society becomes less and less gracious? Remember, God has warned us that these things, they will happen. But what's God's purpose? Why does God send these things on the earth? Well, we can rest assured, beloved, that it is not God's purpose to destroy the world at this time. God has said he sends these things that he might warn the peoples of the world about the end and that the end is coming. And when the devastation and the hurt come, and then when the end does come, then the devastation and the hurt will be infinitely greater uh, than the things that people are indeed experiencing today. And so the Lord God in his mercy, he brings a crisis into uh, this world that he might give mankind, he might give people everywhere still an opportunity, an opportunity to repent, an opportunity to seek the Lord as their God. God's warning reveals to us his mercy. Yes, God says, judgment is coming. See, here are the signs that my judgment is coming. 
But before it comes, the Lord says, I call all mankind to, to turn to me and come to me and to seek their life and to seek their salvation in Jesus Christ. For now, now is the time for all people to turn to God in faith. Now is the time to come and to seek our salvation and to seek your salvation in Jesus Christ. And then at the end of his prophecy, Joel reveals that there is indeed, there is a place of security in this world as we face the troubles of this life. As believers, yes, if it's God's people, we understand that we're living in a hostile and a dangerous world. And God does not promise to Christians either that we're going to be spared from the effects of the judgments, his judgments that are coming on the earth already today. As believers, yes, we know we will be persecuted for our faith. For Christ already made that very clear. But we also need to understand, beloved, that many of the calamities that God sends on this world as a warning to all people, those calamities will also seriously impact our lives. Believers will also suffer the effects of war. We'll also feel the suffering, the pain that comes through the conflict. Our lives will also be impacted by plagues and by viruses. We're reminded of this this week as well as their loved members, also members of the church, who have passed away as a result of a virus because of COVID. Right? And so the virus COVID also hurts us as Christians. And crime and violence, it doesn't only touch unbelievers, it touches also the believers. Earthquakes and tornadoes and natural disasters also destroy our homes and can make lives of believers difficult. And so the reality is, beloved, that this world is a dangerous place also for God's people, for us. And yet, and this is the wonderful comfort that we have, only believers, only those who look to Jesus Christ can find security in this world. The most important words that Peter quotes from Joel are those last words that you find in verse 21. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What's that mean? It means, beloved, that you will not find your security in a place somewhere here on this earth. It means you will not find security in a bomb shelter. You will not find security in the shelter within your home to withstand a hurricane or a tornado. You will not find security in some fortified structure or building. You will not find security in your money and your wealth. You will not find security in the medical care, in the hospitals, in the doctors, and the nurses. No, our security is found in one person, and that is in our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the only one who can save us from the devastation and from the troubles here of this life. So why? Why is he the only one? Because, beloved, these signs of judgment are also a source of hope for us. They remind us that, in Jesus, that the Lord Jesus is the one who is in control. These signs, they, they remind us that the end is coming. And when the end comes, that you and I, we don't need to worry about our life. We don't need to worry about our salvation. Oh, yes, the, the great judgment will be devastating. It will be devastating for all those who reject God and all those who have opposed him. Despite many warnings, they continue to, to reject the Lord Jesus as their Savior even today. But what a comfort. What a comfort that Pentecost gives to us. For the Holy Spirit comes and he opens our hearts to know Jesus Christ. And beloved, when your heart is open to the Lord Jesus, then you will also experience a wonderful peace coming over your life. And your heart will rest secure in the knowledge that in Jesus, my sins are paid for and they are forgiven. In Christ, I have a Savior who will give to me life everlasting. And so in the midst of the troubles of this life, the Holy Spirit helps us to discover 
And the Holy Spirit directs us to the, save ha- to the safe haven who is Jesus Christ. And therefore, beloved, look forward to the future with confidence because we have a Lord and we have a Savior who reigns. Amen.